is, is what I refer to as the four W's. Uh, first of all is, who is it that's giving us this information? Most importantly, why are they giving us this information? And, you know, it pays to be cynical because different people provide information with different ulterior motives. What is it that they're actually telling us? Sometimes the information that we'll receive from informants may not be very coherent because they're excited or because they don't know really what they're talking about. They just want to get back at somebody they heard something. And, and the, the final W that I've always had in my mind is what's in it for them when they're coming forward? Now, I know that you know, everybody likes to talk about you know, the good citizen that comes forward and wants to report something. In, in most human intel, that generally is not what, what happens. Besides the ex-wife, ex-lover, ex-stripper, ex-whatever, uh, the remaining 20% of the informants <laughs> are, are probably going to be people that either have been arrested and want to get out of a, a charge by cooperating, or it could be others that are paid informants. And they're probably among the, uh, the sleaziest to have to deal with. Uh, I'm sure all of you have read articles about informants that like Secret Services had that the whole time they're working for them were out there still doing something behind their back. So when you're dealing with human intel, at some point, if this is going to be an ongoing continual process, you essentially have to form some kind of relationship with that individual. And in some cases, you know, they refer to those people as handlers. And there's a reason for that. It's because you have to handle these people and make sure that what they're giving you, they're not giving to others. Make sure they're not out in the street blagging, you know, bragging about what they're, they're doing because they tend to have a short lifespan afterwards. You lose your, your source of information. But the other thing I, I wanted to mention is we have a whole new avenue in cyber war and cyber crime that really didn't exist you know, 10 years ago. And that is the, the so-called security groups. There's a lot of private interest groups out there. Um, I probably can't mention too many by name. I'll mention one only because there's actually a web page, but there's one group that I'm very active in called Ops Trust. And this is a group of about 400 people from pretty much every country in the world that gets together and basically in their spare time fights different problems. Uh, some of these people are with antivirus companies, some of them are with firewall vendors, some of them are government, some are private uh, ac uh, universities, some are just government agencies that are not DOD. But we all get together because we're sick and tired of seeing problems. And what's interesting is this has become a social vetting process that we can bring others in once other, somebody else establishes trust and brings them in. Now, these aren't bad guys. These aren't, quote, unquote, the typical, stereotypical informant. But we use everybody in these lists to go out and get the information we need. I had an incident in one of the Eastern European blocks where we had to do a takedown, and I couldn't figure out what we needed to actually take down. I was able to pick up my phone and make a phone call to somebody in Eastern Europe that is part of our group. I got an answer I needed in three minutes, made a second phone call to somebody else I knew in our group, and the site was taken down that quickly. But I think the funniest story um, that I remember early, early on was when the IRS started getting hit with the, the get your refund phishing schemes. We had one of our very first sites was was traced to Japan. And I put out some feelers on another group that I'm on and said, you know, help, I need to get a site down, I can't reach anybody, the phone numbers and the who is doesn't work, you know, we can't reach the ISP, you know, just, I'm, I'm dead in the water. So I said, you know, can somebody help me? And I, about five minutes later, I got an email back saying, sure, no problem, I took the site down for you. I wrote back and said, oh my God, that's fantastic. Can you get me the logs? I'd really like to see the logs because we're trying to figure out if this is the same group that's attacking us somewhere else. So he said, well, let me see what I can do. And about five minutes later, I get an email back saying the logs were attached. And I wrote back and said, oh, thanks, man. I really appreciate that. Are you the system administrator? And the person wrote back and said, nope. So for those of you who didn't quite get that joke, it, it really wasn't a joke, but what had happened is some good citizen just decided if the bad guys could break into a server and plant phishing, he could break in and remove it. And the, the moral of the story is you've got to be very careful what you ask people and what you ask people to do. Because some people have even less of a conscience than I do, and they'll go out and do whatever it takes to get information. 
So when you're dealing with informants, you have to abide by some of the laws, at least the important ones, and make sure that the information you get can actually be used. And of course, if it's illegal, it can't be used. And I would like to actually have our esteemed attorney here. He didn't introduce himself as that. But <laughs> I'd like Kevin to talk a little bit about the laws involving information that people do receive from informants and what things can render that information unusable. Uh, thanks for outing me as an attorney, Andy. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, a lot of the law that deals with these issues has to do with privacy issues. Uh, I used to teach the Freedom of Information Act, Privacy Act, and so some of those laws have applicability, but in some cases we deal with informants that, that have uh, information that has to be classified, so that's an entirely different topic. But when it comes to obtaining information from you as a, a public person requesting this information, there are certain exemptions that prohibit that information from being made available and it is protected information. And it will have to do with things such as an, protect an ongoing investigation, uh, the equivalent of sources and methods in the intelligence community, whatnot. So there are some limitations regarding the kind of information that can be even shared within law enforcement. Actually, sometimes when you try to toss it over a fence or whatnot, the fence is too high, we really can't do that. So uh, I don't want to go into a lot of detail about that, but. To kind of follow up on what Andy's talking about as far as this idea of the personal part of this, I think our topic is about human intelligence. Uh, I spent a little time in Southeast Asia back in the late 60s. Uh, I interrogated prisoners of war. I was located in the My Lai area. I was a battalion S2, and they were going through my files as a part of their investigation. I was there after the incident took place. And Vietnam was not only a place where we were collecting a lot of information, we were unfortunately leaking a lot of information. <clears throat> and the concept of OPSEC really started in Vietnam. The purple dragon is one of the phrases you might hear in relation to that topic. And we were gathering a lot of information, but the information we were leaking, we were really not very aware about it. And I think we're doing the same thing on the internet, both in law enforcement and in the intelligence community. Uh, the little ladies in black in the local villages that would come in and sweep and clean in our hooches and whatnot, we're collecting, I'm sure, a lot of information. And so we have to constantly be vigilant, and I use that term advisedly because I'm involved in a very interesting project right now I would urge you to ask me about, and I have some business cards I'd be glad to give you called Project Vigilant. And that project has a goal <clears throat> of, of identifying uh, bad actors doing bad things. And it's a, it's a group of volunteers, some very high-level people involved in this project. and. You know, we can, we rely so much, we rely too much on technology. I won't say too much, I'll say we do too much. Uh, there is no enemy on this planet that we could not defeat or neutralize if only we could identify them, number one, and number two, locate them. And so there's a lot of talk these days about attack attribution and whatnot, and I'm paying a lot of attention to that area in the networking that I do. Uh, I'm not a real high level guy in the technology, I'm really more of a uh, I, I believe that the most important endpoints on any network are the people. And until we reach a singularity event or whatnot, I, I think it's going to remain that way. And even after we have a singularity event, we may have to rely even more on people to control this thing we call technology. So I would urge you, if you're out there networking with each other, to reach out to other people who are smarter than you are. And that's something I've tried to do very much in the last 20 years to bring together a group of uh, friends that I call usual, my usual suspects. And we need to, we need to do a lot more networking <clears throat> with people and, and realizing that technology is only an enabler. It is not the driving force, basically. Just to follow up with what Kevin said, I, I spend a lot of time studying innovative processes and in, in creativity and what drives creativity and how do you cultivate creativity. And, at the end of the day, when you go through the, all the different teachings of it and you meet with people like an Inca chief in, in, in southern Mexico or uh, you visit some samba schools during Carnival and find out why they build the floats the way they do, you realize that there's some commonality about people. And that's a couple things I just want to throw out there to you. Uh, I met with the creative director for Cirque du Soleil and I said, how do you guys sell out performances in India, in Macau? I mean, isn't that like a Vegas show? And his response was like, have you been to one of my shows? I said, yeah. He said, uh, what language do they speak? Mm -hmm. I thought for a minute and then I kind of responded. I said, I, unless I had too many drinks, I, I don't remember them speaking any languages. He said, that's why I can sell 
shows anywhere in the world. Performance speaks all languages. And I'm using that sort of as an anchor to think about for this session that when you engage with people, people love to be told a story. We, we love stories. I mean, our films are based off, largely off the hero's journey. If And you went to film school, when they taught us that, you know, a film is constructed to tell a story. So these are mechanisms and, and processes to keep in mind if you're going to try to find somebody. Uh, the, you know, as these guys said from the law enforcement standpoint, the ex-wife knows probably a lot about that person to give you some personal details, but you're going to have to get creative. You're going to have to know the psychoanalytics of people. You're going to have to realize that a viral video goes viral, newsflash, not because of how it was delivered, but because of the content. Content makes a video go viral. The number two reasons why video goes viral, number one reason, humor. It's funny. We're all people. We love it. We love a funny story. We send it. Number two reason, anger. Anger, like humor, unites. We want to, if we're angry about somebody, we want to propagate that. So I take studies in the marketing industry. I take studies in, in, in politics and campaigning. And I take studies that involve other industries. And I kind of put them in a blender and mash them up and say, at the end of the day, just like Kevin said, it's about the people. So think about those as being attributes to a person, and then you with your technical background understand how you can design payloads and design code to meet those ends, or maybe get a question answered. And then one last thing, the, the best thing I can describe to put this in visual is, you know, we use social proof a lot. Um, we want to be seen with a bunch of friends because that helps us get more friends. Well, the same thing occurs in the digital environment. You go visit a page, how many of you look at how many friends your friends have on Facebook? That's a, that's a, that is looked at a lot. People don't want to admit it. Um, that's a big deal. Oh my God, this guy has 8,000 friends. He probably only talks to three, but uh, that's a big deal. On Twitter, he's not a big Twitter voice. He only has 16 followers. Well, if you talk to the guy today about the, that did the 1 million, 100 million Facebook people leak, I just talked to him this morning. <laughs> uh, he said, what's your Twitter account? He said, it was at... Uh, a couple of hundred and then I had 500 within a half hour. So, you know, we, we have to look at some cyber manifestations of physical things that involve people. And that is really the first step in law enforcement applications, private investigations, etc. is understanding what people react to and then design a strategy for your person of interest and do not rule out the online environment as a, as a, as a tool in that strategy. How many of you uh, uh, know what Maltigo is? Good most. Okay. And uh, how many of you saw the Rod Robin Sage uh, presentation yesterday? Okay. So I mean, th th this manifestation in cyberspace, online, social software, whatever, of uh, what you can learn about somebody uh, is, is really qualitatively different now than it was just a few years ago. Uh, the flip side of this is I don't know how if I were designing a, you know, a strategy to implant an asset somewhere, where it used to be, you know, you, you snuck into the files and you put the guy's uh, records in the university registrar so you could see that they went to XYZ University. Now the whole class has a web page and if you, you know, if, if uh, Malthus comes before uh, Martin and all of a sudden you got somebody inserted there in the middle, they says, oh, who's this new person who got inserted on my website? It gets really hard to build false identities in this space. Uh, and uh, it'd be interesting to see somebody who does this well because I don't think there are very many of them. I, I agree with what Lynn said, but I also think it's, it's something we definitely have to look at. I think people can be duped. I mean, I, you know, you look at some of these online sites